Muy buenos días a, a todas y a todos. Tengo el gusto de, de, de que la División de Agua y Saneamiento del Banco Interamericano de Desarrollo les invita a participar en el sexto seminario virtual que se llama de Tecnologías para Empresas de Agua ante el COVID-19, Detección y Desinfección. Este seminario se enmarca dentro de una serie de, de seminarios, Agua, Saneamiento y Residuos Sólidos en Tiempos de, de Coronavirus, que, que busca compartir acciones innovadoras y, y técnicas aprendidas en el sector de agua y saneamiento y residuos sólidos en América Latina y el Caribe durante y post emergencia. En este seminario eh, se estará presentando tecnologías innovadoras que los operadores de agua y saneamiento puedan adoptar para enfrentar los desafíos de la pandemia. Tenemos una agenda excelente de, de, de panelistas y uh, empezando por Marcelo Bassani, el especialista sinio en agua y saneamiento de la División de Agua y Saneamiento del Banco. Seguiremos con Alejandro Toro, el gerente senior de la región sureste de Estados Unidos, de, de la empresa Isle Américas. Y seguiremos con dos bloques. Un primer bloque sobre tecnología de detección y prueba y un segundo bloque sobre tecnologías de desactivación y eliminación. Terminaremos el seminario con una sesión de, de preguntas y respuestas. Pero antes de, de comenzar, que es, quería simplemente eh, informarles de que tienen la opción de, de escoger traducción. Se encuentra uh, eh, abajo de su pantalla, en el medio, se encuentra un globo y solamente tienen que hacer un clic ahí y escogen el, el idioma que, que necesiten. Bueno, sin más, uh, quiero, quiero introducir a Marcelo Bassani, especialista senior en agua y saneamiento del PID para una pequeña introducción. Marcelo, muy buenos días. Buenos días, Corín. Gracias por la introducción. Eh, bueno, esto eh, es el segundo de cinco webinars que se van a enfocar en temas de tecnología e innovación en este contexto eh, de emergencia sanitaria. Y bueno, es el primero de tres eh, que va a liderar Isle Utilities, un, un socio que nos ha acompañado en, en varias actividades claves en temas de innovación en los últimos años. En particular, eh, Isle Utilities acaba de terminar una búsqueda a nivel global de tecnologías que pueden aportar y ofrecer soluciones innovadoras a los operadores de eh, agua y saneamiento. Y hoy vamos a escuchar los primeros resultados de esta búsqueda. El, uh, si no me equivoco, al, han logrado analizar más de 200 eh, innovaciones. Entonces, realmente yo el, tengo mucha gana de, de, de escuchar estos resultados. Solo una nota eh, de introducción, este webinar se enmarca en un esfuerzo más grande liberado, liderado por el banco, eh, por la división de agua y saneamiento, justamente enfocado en el fomento de la innovación y el desarrollo de soluciones innovadoras en el sector de agua y saneamiento. Eh, más allá de estos webinars, hay varias actividades que estamos eh, ejecutando. Cabe mencionar dos. Eh, uno es el lanzamiento a la brevedad de un concurso de innovación eh, para empresas, eh, Ideas en Acción. Lo vamos a lanzar en aproximadamente un mes. Y la otra es la organización de un IACATON, eh, también sobre el tema de innovación, eh, que eh, también tendrá una línea de, de trabajo sobre el COVID-19. Este IACATON lo vamos a abrir en las próximas horas. Entonces, tengan los ojos bien abiertos. Eh, bueno, tenemos muchos panelistas, no quiero robar demasiado tiempo, le paso la palabra a Corín, seguramente tendremos otras oportunidades de conversar eh, sobre innovación y tecnologías. Gracias. Muchas gracias, Marcelo, y, y empezaremos con Alejandro, Alejandro Toro, que, que es uno de nuestros copresentadores, es gerente senior de la región sudeste de Estados Unidos, de, de AES Américas, Alejandro es un ejecutivo de la industria del agua con más de 25 años de, de experiencia y ha trabajado con clientes públicos, privados e industriales del agua. Y sin más, se dejo la palabra a Alejandro. Alejandro, adelante. Buenos días, Corinne. Uh, muy buenos días Gracias. a todos. Primero quería agradecerle a Marcelo y al personal del banco por facilitar este seminario y también por la participación que han tenido en el proyecto. 
La agenda del seminario es, es la siguiente, brevemente, una introducción sobre IL Utilities, el contexto y el antecedente por el proyecto del cual Marcelo habló, una presentación del alcance del proyecto y presentaciones de cuatro tecnologías que fueron parte de las tecnologías que se evaluaron durante el proyecto, que incluyen Lumen Ultra, Oxford Nanopore, Typhon Systems, Twin Oxide, y después pasaremos a las preguntas. Siguiente, por favor. Uh, IL es una consultora de tecnología que fue fundada en el 2005 con el objetivo único de acelerar la innovación en el sector de agua. Hoy en día contamos con un equipo de unos 95 profesionales alrededor del mundo que incluye ingenieros, científicos y, exper y expertos en el sector del agua. Y también hoy en día estamos apoyando a más de 300 compañías de agua alrededor del mundo. Nuestras capacidades uh, brevemente incluyen la identificación y evaluación de tecnologías emergentes e innovadoras, apoyar la aceleración del desarrollo, adopción y comercialización de las tecnologías, la identificación, la calificación y la cuantificación de oportunidades de mercado para estas tecnologías y por último la colaboración y la participación en foros que permitan el, la transferencia de conocimiento y la adopción de tecnologías innovadoras en todo lo que es el sector de agua. Siguiente. Siguiente. IL, uh, los servicios nuestros básicamente son tres uh, disciplinas fundamentales. La identificación de desarrollos o desafíos en el sector de agua, la conexión de soluciones tecnológicas con los usuarios para enfrentar los desafíos presentes y futuros, y la evaluación, eh, colaboración entre los usuarios y las tecnologías que permita una aceleración a la adopción a las tecnologías. Siguiente. El, 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 el contexto de este proyecto comenzó con el COVID-19. Cuando esto se, originalmente se expandió en Europa y Norteamérica a principios del año, IAL instintivamente uh, creó una plataforma con la aplicación de WhatsApp que permitiera a compañías de agua o usuarios de agua a través de todo el mundo comunicarse y compartir experiencias uh, novedosas, fracasos, éxitos en cuanto al manejo del servicio uh, de agua, dada el impacto tan significativo que tuvo y que sigue teniendo la pandemia COVID-19 en el, en el sector de agua. A uh, eh, resultado de esta participación, muchas de las del grupo comenzaron a preguntarle a él que qué podíamos aportar en términos de tecnología. Al momento, él contactó a más de 2.500 tecnologías alrededor del mundo para entender un poco más su aplicación y su capacidad. Y de esto, básicamente, se encontraron cuatro áreas críticas sobre las que se enfocaron en la búsqueda que hicimos. La una es la detección y pruebas, la otra es la de activación o desinfección del virus, la otra es la capacidad de operar y monitorear remotamente y la otra es la, miti la miti mitigación del, de la operación. Siguiente. Hoy en día la plataforma cuenta con aproximadamente 700 profesionales pertenecientes a 381 organizaciones en, en 63 países uh, alrededor del mundo. Siguiente. La plataforma ha dado el éxito que ha tenido y la colaboración que ha tenido por parte de todos los participantes ahora se ha expandido y IAL creó la plataforma Agua en Acción, la cual hoy en día incluye 10 subgrupos, de los cuales tres van a seguir enfocados exclusivamente en el tema de la pandemia COVID, cinco que no son relacionados al COVID, pero que incluyen temas muy uh, pertinentes al sector de agua hoy en día en términos de operación y los últimos dos es más en, en innovación en términos de tratamientos en químicos y de servicio al, al cliente. La participación con cualquiera de estos subgrupos es totalmente gratis, no requiere ningún compromiso y cualquier persona o entidad que esté interesada en participar solamente pueden, nos, nos contactan a nosotros directamente. Siguiente. El coronavirus y los desafíos al sector del agua son bastantes y muy impactantes. En el agua potable, obviamente, la capacidad de asegurar el cero el riesgo al servicio, 
en términos de la enfermedad y ausencia del personal, eliminará el riesgo de contaminación del personal mientras trabajan prestando el servicio, el impacto que ha tenido sobre la sociedad, específicamente la habilidad del consumidor para pagar el servicio del agua. En alcantarilladas es la medición del virus como un indicativo a la infección en la sociedad, la necesidad del aislamiento, lo que requiere la habilidad de trabajar remotamente y la interrupción del cierre, que ha tenido un impacto grande en la interrupción de las cadenas de abastecimiento. Siguiente. Como Marcelo indicó, el proyecto incluyó una búsqueda a nivel global de las tecnologías y básicamente se concentraron en cuatro áreas. Tecnologías de detección y prueba, de eliminación y desactivación, de monitoreo y control remoto y las soluciones de gestión de contingencias. Como Marcelo indicó, este es el, primero, el primer seminario de tres. Este se enfoca en tecnologías de detección y prueba y tecnologías de eliminación y, des y desactivación. Y ahora para entrar en más detalle en, en términos del alcance del proyecto y, la, y, las, presentaciones, y las presentaciones de las tecnologías, uh, me gustaría pasar la presentación a mi colega Lourdes O'Farrell. So, Corinne. Muchas gracias, Alejandro. Y vamos a pasar al segundo bloque de, de presentadores eh, sobre el tema de tecnologías de detección y prueba, empezando con Lourdes. Lourdes O'Farrell, consultora senior de tecnología en, uh, en Isle Américas. Lourdes es una ingeniera química y ambiental con más de siete años de experiencia trabajando en los sectores del agua y del medio ambiente, incluyendo varias organizaciones internacionales en, la, en las industrias de cervecería y papel. Y el, el presentador siguiente será Jessica Stutt, Directora de Mercadeo de Productos, uh, Jessica eh, es directora de Mercadeo de Productos en Lumin Ultra Technologies, líder mundial en pruebas de diagnóstico biológico. Seguiremos después con una presentación de Dave Tracy, uh, director de canales de venta estratégicos. Dave es un ingeniero profesional con licencia en la provincia de New Brunswick, en Canadá con 18 años de experiencia en el manejo de microbiología en agua, aguas residuales, petróleo y gas y aplicaciones industriales. Y finalmente termina, terminaremos ese bloque um, con uh, Oxford Nanopore Technologies y con la presentación de Jared Coyne, uh, gerente senior de desarrollo de mercadeo. Y Jared se unió a Oxford Nanopore en el 2014 y proporciona eh, productos de secuenciación para el análisis electrónico directo de moléculas individuales. Muchas gracias y sin más le doy la, la, la palabra a Lourdes. Lourdes, buenos días, adelante. Hola, muchas gracias Corinne eh, por las introducciones y muy buenos días a todos. Eh, yo voy a continuar a proporcionarles eh, con una visión general de los resultados obtenidos en las dos primeras categorías o temáticas de este proyecto. Eh, podríamos hablar días de tecnologías, pero lo vamos a resumir en unas cuantas horas. Eh, como mi colega Alejandro les comentaba, el estudio de tecnologías fue dividido en cuatro categorías eh, y cada una de las categorías está dividido en subcategorías. Eh, la primera categoría siendo la de detección y prueba. Siguiente. Para esta sección eh, hemos revisado las últimas tecnologías que ayudan a las empresas de servicios públicos a detectar y probar específicamente el virus SARS-CoV-2 en las operaciones de agua y aguas residuales. Eh, como ya sabemos, el SARS-CoV-2 es el virus causante de la enfermedad infecciosa COVID-19. En esta categoría se incluyeron eh, tecnologías para la detección y o prueba del virus en el agua, así como en superficies eh, ambientales y en el aire. Estas tecnologías eh, van desde la preparación de muestra hasta su detección. Adicionalmente, eh, el monitoreo continuo de estos síntomas relacionados con el COVID en el personal es muy crítico eh, para mitigar el riesgo de transmisión de la enfermedad en el lugar de trabajo. Por lo tanto, eh, también se incluyeron eh, en este estudio las técnicas de detección temprana o sustitutas eh, al SARS-CoV-2 en el personal. Con base a estos criterios, eh, se estableció el alcance de la búsqueda de tecnologías de esta temática en tres subcategorías. La primera son dispositivos de campo, eh, que incluye eh, kits o equipo de prueba rápida. 
Eh, luego pasamos a tecnologías de epidemiología basada en aguas residuales y esto incluye eh, plataformas o softwares eh, de diagnóstico clínico para el monitoreo del virus en el agua. Y finalmente, eh, la vigilancia fisiológica, que incluye tecnologías que se pueden implementar de manera rápida y flexible eh, con el personal para detectar los síntomas tempranos asociados con la infección del COVID-19. Hablaremos eh, un poco más de cada una. Eh, se identificaron aquí eh, un total de 19 tecnologías con un nivel de madurez o un TRL eh, de 7 a 9. Esto significa que son tecnologías en las últimas fases de comercialización o que ya completamente están disponibles al público y esto es para pues, garantizar que las soluciones se puedan implementar de manera rápida y confiable eh, en esta pandemia. Las tecnologías eh, son pro, eh, provenientes de diferentes países, desde China, eh, Australia, Europa, Estados Unidos y Canadá. Siguiente. Ahora existen dos metodologías utilizadas generalmente para detectar el virus eh, y estos son usando marcadores genéticos. Los ensayos eh, moleculares son los que generalmente se utilizan para eh, detectar el virus en el laboratorio. Eh, son técnicas como la de PCR eh, y estas son técnicas pues, un poco más complicadas que tienen un equip utilizan equipo especializado y toman bastante tiempo para, para preparar y hacer pero eh, son las más precisas eh, para detectar directamente si el, si el virus está presente. Y vemos que con las tecnologías emergentes de hoy en día, este tiempo se reduce significativamente y que el equipo ahora, en vez de ser tan súper complicado, ahora es desplegable y portátil. Eh, luego tenemos ensayos inmunológicos y es, estos son los que detectan la presencia de anticuerpos eh, específicos que, que crea el SARS-CoV-2 eh, cuando se ha replicado. Estos son un poco menos eficientes eh, porque obviamente detectan la presencia, del, no detectan la presencia del virus inmediatamente, sino que después de que se ha infectado. Siguiente. A continuación pasamos a ver eh, algunas de las tecnologías eh, que hacen esto. Las uh, dos de arriba eh, se indica, eh, pues son pruebas que, muy parecidas, que se toma una muestra en el agua y hace, se hace una prueba de campo que, indico, que indica si el virus está presente. Eh, Lumin Ultra está un poco más avanzado eh, y vamos a conocer un poco más de esto eh, adelante. Lo interesante es que eh, todas eh, son eh, eficientes y proveen resultados en menos de una hora, cuando tradicionalmente son días. El AMPOR, por ejemplo, es una técnica un poco diferente, pero igual forma resultados similares. Y SELECT es una herramienta más de concentración de la muestra que lo hace de manera rápida. O sea, que los resultados son un poco más comprensibles. En el reporte final de nuestro estudio, se incluyen mucha más información acerca de cada una de las tecnologías que se han identificado a lo largo del proyecto. Estos solo son unos pocos ejemplos. Siguiente. Pasando a tecnologías de epidemiología basada en aguas residuales, pues hay pruebas ya de que el virus está presente en aguas residuales y que esto se puede monitorear. Ahora, esta información se puede utilizar de diferentes formas y de manera muy eficiente. Nuestra búsqueda de tecnologías entonces se centró en identificar soluciones y servicios de epidemiología de aguas residuales ofrecidos por compañías privadas, eh, donde se integran capacidades de inteligencia artificial y machine learning en, en softwares eh, para analizar los resultados de pruebas y mapear el estado del brote eh, en una comunidad. Este tipo de, de estudios se, han, se están haciendo ya en varios países globalmente, en Australia, en Reino Unido, en Italia, hay bastante evidencia eh, que logró identificar potenciales eh, focos de virus. Siguiente. En cuanto a las tecnologías identificadas, estas son mayormente de analítica de datos eh, que miran dónde está el virus y cómo se está moviendo en las aguas residuales. Eh, todas las tecnologías tienen un concepto bastante similar, eh, pero con diferentes enfoques. Algunas eh, utilizan datos de otras plataformas, mientras otras crean sus propios datos. Eh, todas son eh, tecnologías muy eficientes con herramientas bastante visuales que proveen 
verdad, una buena idea sobre la potencial propagación del, del virus. Siguiente. Y seguimos con eh, tecnologías para la vigilancia fisiológica. A, la, a medida que las personas eh, comienzan a regresar al lugar de trabajo, eh, estas tecnologías se pueden emplear para un monitoreo continuo de los síntomas relacionados con el COVID y minimizar la transmisión. En esta categoría pues hay bastante tecnologías y, y bastantes también en desarrollo y esto es obviamente porque el, el campo es un poco más avanzado ya que hemos estado monitoreando síntomas de enfermedades mucho antes eh, que el COVID apareciera. Así que hemos identificado una gran cantidad, por ejemplo, de tecnologías para la toma de temperatura corporal, eh, pero también vemos equipo para el monitoreo de la frecuencia respiratoria o la cardíaca, así como otros indicadores emergentes del COVID, como el aire exhalado o la acústica de la voz, de la tos. Perdón. Muchas eh, también de las cuales integran eh, capacidades de inteligencia artificial para poder presentar estos resultados en, en tiempo real. Siguiente. Vemos muchas tecnologías innovadoras en el campo de, de detección térmica, eh, como hacer las gafas eh, inteligentes de Rocket. Eh, otros como Thermal Screen son capaces de escanear a toda una persona y luego detectar el rostro para tomar la temperatura en el lugar apropiado y ser una temperatura más eh, eficiente. Vemos estas tecnologías ya en, en utilizadas en muchos hospitales, en, en aeropuertos, en algunos negocios. Eh, otras tecnologías en nuestro estudio eh, también sirven para, para el monitoreo de grandes multitudes de personas, lo cual lo, lo vemos bastante interesante. Eh, alguna, siguiente. Algunas eh, más emergentes son las de los análisis de aliento y de tos. Eh, vemos aquí que, que son de madurez un poco más baja o TRL7, o sea que estas no, no están todavía en el mercado, pero eh, las vamos a ver muy próximamente. Ahora, eh, a continuación, conoceremos un poco más de dos de estas tecnologías. Así que le paso la palabra a Jessica Stutt de Luminultra. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, look. So I'm, I am here with my colleague, Dave Tracy, who is going to be available for questions at the end, and I'm going to be presenting on our environmental monitoring solutions. You can go to the next slide. So just to introduce a little bit about Lumen Ultra. So we are headquartered in Canada, although we have locations across, around the world, including in the US, Europe, and in Australia. We were founded in 1995 and have predominantly worked in the water sector, uh, working with water and wastewater and different industrial applications to develop biological diagnostic testing solutions. Um, In the last few months, as the pandemic has hit us, our prime minister in Canada put out a call to action for companies to do what they could to help fight the pandemic. And in um, that call, our CEO responded and we discovered that we would be able to provide support for the clinical testing efforts of uh, Canada and other nations as well by providing the RNA extraction reagents that are needed to do human clinical testing. So we have actually expanded to be a key supplier to the government of Canada in producing these extraction reagents and are producing over 500,000 tests per week to the Canadian government. And this really factors into what we've been able to develop combining our industrial background with now this work in the clinical space to develop an environmental testing solution. So we'll go to the next slide. So as many will know, environmental testing is not new in terms of monitoring for overall community health and bio threats. It's been used for decades in a variety of ways um, to do this kind of monitoring of populations. In addition, environmental testing, including surface testing, has been used in industries such as healthcare, but as well manufacturing and food processing. And we've been involved in supporting with solutions that can do this. So it's combining this existing concept to do this, use the same reliable, fast and sensitive testing methods 
to now quantify the risk of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, the virus that causes COVID-19 in our communities and in our workplaces. Let's go to the next slide. So we have typically worked um, to enhance wastewater treatment overall. So there's a few ways that we have worked with wastewater. Um, so we have biological monitoring tools that can measure the living biomass and also the response that happens to process changes to evaluate that response. This has enabled overall process optimization within systems and has ensured that stability is maintained before toxicity um, becomes too big of an issue. So we are all about um, preventative testing to ensure that larger problems don't happen down the road. And since we've introduced a DNA-based monitoring solution, we've been able to provide further insight into the microbiome through that DNA testing. And that preventative approach to monitoring your system is what we think is a really valuable tool in the fight against COVID-19. If we go to the next slide. Because environmental testing of wastewater allows for this early and continuous identification of the SARS-CoV-2 virus in our communities. Um, so there are a few ways that this can be put to use. So one is that we've seen research from around the world that asymptomatic carriers, so people who never demonstrate symptoms, um, are potentially spreading the virus throughout our communities and we're not aware of it. In addition to the asymptomatic who could be shedding virus and that could be detected in wastewater, there are also pre-symptomatic. So if testing for people is being done based on symptoms being present, the presence of the virus can be detected in wastewater in advance of those symptoms being present, which allows for this early onset warning system very similar to what we've done traditionally in the industrial side. This kind of testing allows for the overall picture of community health earlier than other testing methods, such as human testing could allow. And also the potential to screen segments of wastewater collection coming into to plants can allow that specific point of entry in urban centers to identify specific neighborhoods that may be suffering from uh, increased cases before they're aware of that. We'll go to the next slide. This testing is done using our qPCR methodology. So as Lourdes mentioned, um, this has traditionally been a lab-based method that we have been bringing into the field in a variety of different industries. The device looks like it does in this diagram here. It is you know, portable and easy to use within a non-lab setting. Um, it allows for the results to be achieved in field in under two hours without having to ship away. And this technology is, is using the same principles applied in human clinical tests. So I mentioned our work on the clinical side for the Government of Canada. Um, this is the same concept being applied into environmental monitoring. And our solution is able to test a multiple of environments. So this can be applied to surface testing and can be used in, place, in workplaces, for example, testing doorknobs in high traffic areas to evaluate the presence. It can also be used for air testing and of course, wastewater testing. The wastewater testing, um, you can pair it with an open source RNA extraction for wastewater as part of a developer kit currently to do this kind of testing. And essentially it follows these three main steps outlined on this diagram, wherein the sample is collected from the different environment that you are trying to test. That sample is preserved and the RNA is purified. And that purified RNA is mixed with the reagents to transcribe the RNA into DNA, which is what allows for the qPCR measurement and the ultimate result in under two hours. I'll go to the next slide. And I think what's important to mention here, we're obviously all highly focused on COVID-19 and the current state of the pandemic that we find ourselves in. But the expectation longer term is, is going to be that we are all more prepared for future threats that could appear. Um, and so I think it's important to note that this kind of qPCR testing and our gene count device 
can be used um, as a platform for ongoing pathogen defense. And as you know, governments and municipalities and private companies are expected to be more prepared um, that this could be a key tool in early identification of not just the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So this could include a range of pathogens, including the Norwalk and noroviruses, the various viruses within SARS, MERS, and things like E. coli and Legionella. And I'll go to the next slide. And that this is the same platform that can also target multiple microbial threats. So the preventative approach that Lumen Ultra has always advocated for where testing can be an early identifier of all kinds of different um, potential problems within your uh, system, this can be used on the SARS-CoV-2 side, but as well for the, um, the threats that are challenging your system overall. So things like being able to test overall total E. coli or the nitrifying prokaryotes. Um, that this single platform with different assays could be used in developing that full measurement strategy. And that is really um, our presentation today. I do want to mention that in addition to Dave and I who are here today, we do have a dedicated member of our sales team who is handling Latin America. He's a native of Honduras and fluent in Spanish. He's actively involved in growing our business in the region and we are actively growing the business there. So that is another opportunity to reach out and discuss further with us. And that's it for me, thank you. Okay. Good morning, and thank you very much for inviting me to speak today. So today I'm gonna to talk about our company, Oxford Nanopore, and the technology Nanopore sequencing, and how it can be used for water surveillance, and also for SARS-CoV-2 detection. So first, I'd like to, if you could move to the next slide, please. So first, let's talk a bit about Oxford Nanopore. So the company is based in Oxford in the UK and was founded in 2005. And it was charged to develop disruptive methods for biological analysis. And it was in 2014 that it launched the Minine, the world's first portable sequencing platform. And for those of you who can see me on camera, I'm just holding the device here. So it's roughly the size of an office stapler. So since then, the company has scaled to over 500 employees and we now have offices located all over the world. And we recently opened up a new manufacturing facility aptly named the Minine Building, which is enabling large scale and automated production processes. So next slide, please. Now the core technology utilizes sequencing of nucleic acids, so sequencing of DNA and RNA molecules. And sequencing allows you to gather the genetic blueprint of all organisms. And it's Oxford Nanopore's goal to enable the genetic analysis of any living thing by anyone, anywhere. And the data from a Nanopore sequencing device can be generated in real time and we've already seen the technology being used for a very broad range of applications, including for surveillance of viral outbreaks, as was the case for the Ebola outbreaks in West Africa. Next slide, please. Now I've mentioned portability and I've mentioned real-time sequencing, and this is enabled based on the fundamentals of how nanopore sensing works. Now, it's not going to be a surprise that nanopores form the heart of the technology. And a nanopore is essentially a very small hole that functions as a gateway between two systems. Now, what we do is set a nanopore in a membrane that has very high electronic resistance so that an ionic current can pass through the nanopore when a voltage is applied. Now, as an analyte, passes through a nanopore, it will cause a characteristic disruption of this ionic current 
as you can see in graphic two, represented by this red dot passing through the nanopore. Now, when you introduce a la larger analyte, in this case, represented by a blue dot in graphic three, that will cause a further step change in the current disruption. And nanopore sensing is essentially the measurement and characterization of this disruption in current. And this measurement can be done in real time. Now, as the sensing measurements are based on electronics rather than optics, the technology can be miniaturized into something as portable as the minime or scaled to meet the experimental needs. So next slide, please. So in addition to the portable minime, Oxford Nanopore also offers benchtop instruments, gridine, permethine, and this allows users to adjust their throughput and sample numbers depending on need. Now the workflows are relatively quick and easy, although it does generally require the operation of a pipette. And depending on the analysis type, the downstream data analysis can be done in real time and give you a very, very quick answer. So next slide, please. So real-time surveillance of water systems can also be enabled through nanopore sequencing. And it is our goal to enable real-time detection of pathogens, system-wide monitoring of wastewater microbiomes, and surveillance of drug resistance that is dispersed in water and ecosystems. Next slide, please. So you may not be aware but nanopore sequencing has already been used for wastewater monitoring. As one example, a group in Sweden demonstrated that nanopore sequencing has been used for detecting fecal contamination in urban stormwater systems. So in this study, they compared methods of cultivation of E. coli, so E. coli, a fecal indicator bacteria, and this was compared to sequencing approaches. And this study demonstrated that the use of DNA sequencing to detect human fecal contamination in stormwater systems, and also the potential for tracing this fecal contamination directly in the field. Now, there are many other case studies of uh, the use of nanopore sequencing in wastewater treatment plants. And I would encourage you to read the array of publications that you can see on our website. Next slide, please. So nanopore sequencing has also been used for assessing water quality. In this one example, a study of freshwater source in Cambridge in the UK, the group demonstrated a simple, fast and inexpensive method to yield high resolution pathogen maps that ad may address concerns of public health. So on the right hand side, I've picked out a graphic showing the workflow which can be done quite rapidly and involves sampling of the water, filtration, DNA extraction, followed by the sequencing preparation and sequencing on the device, followed by analysis that you can get on the host computer, in this case, a laptop done in real time. So finally, I'd just like to talk about the opportunity for nanopore sequencing and SARS CoV-2 detection in wastewater. Now, as Jessica mentioned there in the previous talk, there's obviously the capabilities of detecting uh, SARS-CoV-2 in wastewater and the opportunities that this presents. So Oxford Nanopore is already working with health laboratories around the world and researchers to support the current COVID-19 pandemic. Internationally, the Nanopore community has provided public data sets for epidemiological work or to research the virus, the broader disease, and associated pathogens. So nanopore sequencing has been used to detect and sequence the virus in just seven hours. Now this encompasses a whole genome sequencing approach using a protocol developed by researchers within the Arctic network. So that is very much focused on delivering epidemiological information. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry, uh, if you could skip through another slide as well. And yeah, the next slide please as well. Yeah. So recent research has shown that SARS-CoV-2 is detectable in wastewater. 
and can be used as a lead indicator of COVID-19 outbreak dynamics. Now, nanopore sequencing offers the opportunity for real-time surveillance of wastewater as a potential epidemiological tool. And this will provide insights into the presence of SARS-CoV-2 in local communities. Now, this can be done via a targeted approach. This is where you look at specific regions within the SARS-CoV-2 genome. There is also the opportunity to take a broader metagenome approach and sequence all of the microbes and pathogens present in a sample. Now, both targeted and metagenome nanopore approaches are already being utilized by research communities taken from patient swabs. Now, for wastewater, some upfront optimization is required, given that wastewater is a different matrix from uh, clinical swabs. Now, finally, we are developing a method called LAMPOR. This is a new assay for a simple absence or presence detection of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Now, the key feature of LAMPOR is that it's a rapid, low-cost, and highly scalable test that can be de deployed in both high-throughput uh, central centralized settings, as well as smaller local environments. This will open up opportunities for large scale and routine screening. Now LAMPOR, which uses an isothermal amplification method and reduces the burden on reagents and costs, can be scaled where you can do from one to 96 samples processed in just over an hour on a single minine consumable. And the Gridine, a larger scale benchtop device, can process up to five times as many samples. So I'd encourage you to visit our website to find out more about the technology. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Gerard. And we're gonna start our second, in uh, Spanish, sería mejor, me imagino. <laughs> Vamos a empezar eh, el, el segundo bloque de presentadores sobre tecnologías de desactivación y eliminación. Empezando con Lourdes, que, que presentamos. Peter McNulty, uh, uh, the Typhon Treatment System. And uh, Peter, um, desde la fundación de, la, de su empresa en 2014, se desempeñó como el CEO de Typhon Treatment System. Uh, es un alto ejecutivo emprendedor con más de 30 años de experiencia en el crecimiento de empresas de ingeniería ambiental. Y terminaremos con uh, Dr. Joe Newsma, uh, cofundador y principal toxicólogo. Eh, el Dr. Newsma es cofundador y principal toxicólogo de Twin Oxide North America, que es una empresa eh, que importa Twin Oxide, uh, es importador de Twin Oxide de los Países Bajos. La empresa matriz Twin Oxide ha existido durante casi 20 años y tiene negocio en muchas otras áreas en el mundo. Bueno, le, le dejo la palabra entonces a Peter, no, primero a, a Lourdes, perdón. Lourdes, adelante. Gracias. Gracias, Corinne. Ahora eh, pasaremos a la siguiente categoría de desactivación y eliminación, comenzando primero con el tema de desactivación. Ahora, en nuestro estudio se, investiga, se investigó la capacidad comprobada de las técnicas para eliminar o desactivar el virus según la literatura existente, o sea que eh, parte de esta investigación puede referirse al SARS-CoV-1 cuando hay ausencia de evidencia sobre el SARS-CoV-2, ya que ambas tienen una estructura bastante similar. Y debido a lo reciente de la pandemia, eh, existe muy poca información acerca del SARS-CoV-2, eh, por lo que ninguna de las tecnologías ha sido probada específicamente para la eliminación, de, eh, eliminación o desactivación del SARS-CoV-2, pero sí para el SARS-CoV-1. Eh, existen una variedad de técnicas para la des desactivación y eliminación de patógenos. Esta tabla eh, presenta una lista no exhaustiva de las técnicas convencionales y las emergentes y su efectividad comprobada eh, para SARS-CoV-1 y O2. Eh, nosotros nos hemos enfocado en los tres primeros tipos de convencionales en donde ya se han encontrado evidencia de efectividad ante la desactivación y eliminación de SARS-CoV-1 
eh, que son eh, tecnologías basadas en cloro, tecnologías de luz ultravioleta y filtración por medio de membranas. El informe final eh, contiene mucha más información y, y todas las referencias utilizadas en nuestra investigación en cuanto a la desactivación específica del SARS-CoV-1 o el 2, eh, el cloro y la luz ultravioleta son los más eficientes eh, según la literatura, eh, seguido luego por dióxido de cloro. Eh, lo más reciente también que la OMS eh, sugiere en este tipo de instancias es que un mínimo de 0.5 miligramos litro de cloro libre después de 30 minutos de tiempo de contacto a un pH de 8 que es para la desactivación, eh, sea eficiente. Siguiente. Eh, para esta sección, eh, hemos eh, hecho varias subcategorías. Entonces, para la desactivación basada en cloro, eh, se identificaron 12 tecnologías innovadoras que incluyen el uso del clorogás, el clorito de sodio y el dióxido de cloro, eh, así como soluciones para redes de distribución. Estas eh, son soluciones que obviamente también sirven para, como desinfectantes normales de primarios, los que se utilizan para la desactivación de patógenos en, en agua potable, o para eh, desinfectantes secundarios, los que forman residual, eh, cloro residual para mantener los sistemas de distribución. Así que encontramos una gran variedad de tecnologías que se pueden aplicar y por lo tanto nosotros nos enfocamos en tecnologías de madurez alta, o sea, 8 y 9, eh, que pueden aplicarse de manera inmediata y compañías de todo el mundo, pero que tienen presencia global. Siguiente. Aquí tenemos eh, un poco más de información acerca de las características de, este, de estos tres tipos de técnicas de cloración. Eh, cada uno, cada una tiene una... Eh, potencial diferente, eh, diferente efectividad, por lo que no voy a tomar el tiempo ahorita para, para mostrarles más información, para poder pasar a las, a las tecnologías. Siguiente. Eh, bueno, la cloración es bastante común, así que encontramos también una gran cantidad de tecnologías aplicables, eh, pero lo hicimos, eh, nosotros identificamos las más innovadoras y las más eficientes. Entonces aquí mostramos solo dos ejemplos eh, de cada tipo de cloración eh, que se menciona y lo hemos hecho por, codificados por color. Eh, los, las verdes utilizan eh, clorogás, las naranjas hipoclorito de sodio y las, de moder, las demoradas son de dióxido de cloro. Eh, todas las tecnologías eh, son de generación in situ y presentan efectividad eh, bastante alta en cuanto a la desactivación de SARS-CoV-1. Eh, por lo que se espera que sirva también para, para el SARS-CoV-2. Siguiente. Ahora, pasando a otro tipo de, des de desactivación, tenemos luz ultravioleta. Aquí eh, la longitud de onda que nos interesa más es la VC, que es la, la longitud de onda corta que se considera la germicida. Y esta está entre los 200 y 300 nanómetros y eh, son ondas que son fuertemente absorbidas por los ácidos nucleicos, destruyendo la estructura del ADN de los patógenos y por lo tanto desactiva, inactivándolos. Investigaciones eh, muestran eficiencia de desactivación de SARS-CoV-1, eh, por lo que también se espera que sirva para SARS-CoV-2. Ahora, la principal eh, diferencia entre los reactores VC eh, son el tipo de lámpara eh, que utilizan la cual ofrece pues, diferentes beneficios basados en la calidad o, y el flujo del agua. Y esas pueden ser eh, lámparas LED, lámparas de baja presión, eh, de amalgama o lámparas de media presión. Y aquí hay más información, pero pasaremos a la siguiente. Aquí encontramos 10 tecnologías eh, que utilizan VC, eh, todas con un nivel de madurez alto, ya comerciales, eh, provenientes de diferentes países, pero eh, todas con presencia global también. Siguiente. Otra vez proporcionamos aquí eh, ejemplos codificados por color de las cuatro tipos de, de, UVs, de tecnologías de VC. Eh, las de verde son, eh, utiliza, eh, utilizan LED, 
eh, las de naranja, baja presión, las de morado, lámpar, son lámparas de amalgama y la turquesa eh, usando mediana presión. Cada una es eh, aplicable a diferentes caudales y también en el reporte final, así como en nuestra plataforma de tecnologías para este proyecto, se encuentra mucha más información acerca de cada una de las tecnologías aquí identificadas. Siguiente. Y finalmente tenemos la segunda parte de la segunda categoría, que es eh, la de eliminación. Siguiente. Aquí eh, nos hemos enfocado en membranas de filtración. Ahora el SARS-CoV-2 mide aproximadamente entre 50 y 200 nanómetros de diámetro. Eh, por lo tanto, solo hemos incluido membranas capaces de retener ese tamaño de partícula, eh, que son las, las que ven aquí, ultrafiltración, nanofiltración y osmosis inversa. Eh, y lo cual pues, excluye otro tipo de membranas como las de microfiltración, que son un poco más grandes. Eh, aquí mostramos un poco más de información que también pueden leer eh, después, pero pasaremos a, a la siguiente. Eh, en esta sección identificamos 10 tecnologías, todas eh, con un tamaño de poro inferior al 50 nanómetros. Eh, también todas de madurez alta, ya comerciales y eh, de, con presencia global. Siguiente. Aquí tenemos otra vez eh, ejemplos de algunas tecnologías y siguiendo el mismo patrón eh, de colores, tenemos eh, las verdes, que son membranas de ultrafiltración, tenemos unas de polietileno, otras que utilizan cerámica, eh, las de naranja son nanofiltración, eh, unas por ejemplo usan capas, de dio, capas con dióxido de titanio y otras con capas múltiples y eh, tenemos eh, las moradas que son de osmosis inversa y que por ejemplo eh, tenemos ahí aqua membranes que es, es muy innovadora y utiliza impresión 3D para, capa, para imprimir capas múltiples en espiral, lo cual lo hace geométricamente muy uniforme y bastante eficiente. Eh, nuevamente, tenemos para ustedes presentaciones de dos tecnologías eh, de desactivación, así que se le doy la palabra a Peter McNulty de Typhoon Treatment Systems. Peter. Uh, thank you, Lourdes, for that summary, and uh, thank you very much to uh, Isle and the uh, IADB for uh, uh, inviting me to, uh, to present here today. Um, as, uh, as was described, uh, Typhon Treatment Systems uh, is one of the world's leading developers of ultraviolet LED water treatment technology, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, the company, uh, the technology, and potential applications uh, with uh, COVID-19 in the uh, Latin American region. Uh, all right, yep, second slide. Um, so in many ways, similar to the visible light LEDs, the promise of ultraviolet LED technology is significant uh, cost savings and energy consumption. So uh, our uh, indications and uh, experience is that uh, the promise of UV LED technology, specifically in, in our patented reactors, can save uh, as much as 90% energy, and that has profound implications. Um, uh, I'd like to point out that our technology was conceived in the developing world. My business partner and I met on uh, off-grid water projects uh, in Nigeria and other areas in Sub-Saharan Africa. So it's really an honor to be invited to uh, present here. Um, we look forward very much to getting back to um, that, those applications. Um, we are a six-year-old company. We do have uh, intellectual property around the, uh, the technology. We did uh, quite a lot of testing uh, at the uh, lab scale with our university partners and then on into field scale and then through to validation. So um, the uh, uh, validation program that we used for our technology was with the US Environmental Protection Agency's uh, program, which is widely accepted around the world. Um, we are a commercial enterprise and uh, have uh, our, our first large scale uh, municipal uh, treatment uh, uh, application going in later this year. It's been a bit delayed uh, because of the, 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 the recent pandemic. Next slide, please. Um, the applications for our technology, uh, which is primarily focused on, on water and wastewater, 
our uh, municipal drinking water, municipal wastewater, which has been mentioned here. Uh, there is some evidence to suggest that the, uh, the virus and uh, cells it's infected can be detected in wastewater. Uh, that might be a, a critical application for the future. Uh, wastewater reuse, this is a growing uh, application around the world. And um, uh, we look forward to, 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 to those applications with potential uh, partners in the future. Uh, importantly for this uh, uh, presentation, off-grid and point of entry, uh, household and community level uh, water treatment technologies. We do have uh, applications that we are uh, uh, working with partners now around the world with remote rural uh, community level water treatment uh, uh, applications. It's very exciting for us. Um, in addition, our technology can be used in food and beverage, uh, ultra pure water treatment in the semiconductor industry, uh, paper and pulp, et cetera. Uh, in addition, uh, for aquaculture, hospitals, groundwater remediation, and residential. Uh, I'll show in a, uh, another slide the uh, size equipment that we use for uh, sink top or household uh, uh, applications. Um, our technology uh, is a biological disinfection uh, system. It can be used to treat viruses. It is validated to, uh, to treat uh, uh, for biological disinfection. And um, the dose for uh, a, a virus of concern that uh, the EPA focuses on, which is adenovirus, is much more difficult to, to inactivate than is currently indicated by the current understanding of the uh, treatment of uh, UV for coronaviruses. Um, the literature is somewhat thin on coronavirus treatment. And as uh, uh, our friends from Isle pointed out earlier, um, it is exceedingly difficult to get your hands on this uh, uh, organism we would use indicator microbes uh, under any circumstances. But uh, at any rate, we are treating for bacteria and protozoa, uh, like some of the gut pathogens that are familiar to uh, folks in the developing world. In addition, we do have an advanced oxidation process, which is used to treat uh, toxic chemicals. Um, and that's a combined system that uh, um, is a, a different uh, arrangement. So as I mentioned, the uh, adenovirus is something that uh, is uh, specifically addressed in the literature. And the current indication that we have is that the dose to treat adenovirus is approximately 20 times higher than would be required for COVID-19. And therefore, we, I think, have a reasonable claim that, that our technology uh, could certainly be used to treat the uh, coronaviruses. Next slide, please. So a little bit about LED technology and the promise that it holds for, for the future. Um, the, uh, graph on the left uh, shows the output power of uh, ultraviolet LEDs. And, and, and as was pointed out earlier also, these are the UVC or short wave uh, uh, wavelengths, uh, which are the, 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 the biologically disinfecting wavelengths. Um, the, like all semiconductors, the output power uh, has gone up significantly over time. In fact, it's been uh, many times higher than it was even when we started with our prototype testing five years ago. And then in addition, for, for, for any application, um, one must consider the costs. And it has uh, been very interesting to follow the, the decrease in costs of, again, much like semiconductor electronics elsewhere, uh, a significant decline in, in cost and, and therefore uh, an improvement in cost, cost benefit. All the major UV LED suppliers that we uh, work with uh, report that they expect significant uh, uh, improvement uh, to continue for, for decades. Um, next slide, please. So the, uh, as, as sort of indicated by the previous slide, um, there is a decreasing operational cost over time. These are long lasting devices. Again, for those of us who are familiar with LEDs know that they last a long time. Um, we are currently able to offer multi-year uh, warranties for our equipment. Um, that's meaningful for remote and, and rural areas um, where uh, spare parts and so forth are, are difficult to come by. Um, there is a significantly lower whole life cost, uh, as shown in the graph on the right, um, than a, a traditional mercury lamp uh, system. So um, the design is resilient. The uh, uh, same equipment can be used with the newer LEDs over time. Um, we've always known that the application uh, uh, gets better and better. And so we've designed the equipment to make. Uh, to make it possible for those change outs when they do happen to be compatible with uh, uh, the, the, the future generations and, and the past. So um, 
they are quite tough. These are solid state electronics and um, it's, it's, it's terrific to design these, these uh, systems because uh, they have very few moving parts and uh, they're really tough, good, good for such uh, uh, remote field applications. And here's a, a point that I think is really important to make for uh, the developing regions where uh, uh, the audience might be considering applications. Um, our technology requires no exemption to the UN Minamata uh, Convention banning mercury. There is no mercury in our uh, UV equipment um, and, there, and there is in mercury lamp uh, technologies. Therefore, there is no disposal problem. Um, in remote regions of the world, uh, there is uh, not a very well-developed, often not a very well-developed uh, disposal system. Um, that would not be a problem with our technologies and, and we're, we're really excited about it and, and for that reason. Um, next slide, please. So here's uh, an image of the reactor. The, the uh, photo on the left uh, shows our large scale municipal reactor. This is a, a, a system that is currently validated for 250 cubic meters per hour. Um, and, and that is uh, to serve uh, in, an, in, a, in an, uh, 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 an OECD type application, about 40,000 uh, individuals. And uh, in some regions of the world where the, the water demand is lower, not so much landscaping uh, of our own residences, et cetera, could be two to three times as much. Um, so one of these reactors can serve a lot of people. Um, it is a closed loop cooling system. Um, the cooling coil, which you can see uh, those, those copper uh, uh, coils are cooling the LEDs. It is a, a passive system and uh, there's deionized water, deionized water in there. Um, we monitor the temperature of the LEDs, again, like a, like a, like a laptop, um, they, they can't get hot. Um, so uh, our, our cooling system uh, uh, has been designed to take care of that. Um, the equipment is very easy to do change outs for the LEDs. And uh, so therefore the, the, the field expense is, uh, is, is minimized. Next slide, please. So this illustration shows a little bit uh, about our design basis with respect to the efficiency. Um, at this point, ultraviolet LEDs are not very electrically efficient, uh, but our reactor is germicidally efficient. So uh, we are able to buy LEDs which are uh, manufactured to emit the wavelength, which is at the maximum peak of absorption uh, by DNA and the uh, amino acids that, that, that are the targets for uh, microbial disinfection. Um, that's a huge benefit. We get about a 40 to 50% efficiency bump uh, just by, by uh, tuning the wavelength to the, to the, to the, to the optimal. In addition, the uh, uh, array of LEDs around the outside of the reactor rather than submerged tubes enables us to uh, provide a really optical, uh, efficient, optically efficient uh, irradiant uh, uh, distribution, uh, which has a significant effect on, on the overall efficiency of the reactor. In addition, uh, as shown in the illustration in the lower left, um, there is very important consideration of hydraulic efficiency. And it is, uh, this is a cross section in the lower left of a, a traditional mercury lamp system that has a lot of dead space in it and a lot of wasted energy being emitted by those lamps uh, going into water, which is stagnant and not uh, the water that's being treated. Our treatment system um, is very hydraulically efficient as shown in, in, the, in the illustration on the right-hand side. And that makes us uh, uh, electrically efficient as a reactor by reactor uh, comparison uh, in 2020 and in the future Again, we expect to be 90% more energy efficient, um, which has a significant benefit for um, even the, 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 the locations where one can install it. Um, maybe I could pause at this point to mention that um, one of our uh, sincere hopes is that our equipment can be connected to a, a panel of uh, 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 photo cells to use the power of the sun with direct current into our treatment systems, which are DC to do that disinfection. Um, uh, we don't have any applications uh, 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 using that yet, but we've, uh, we've done some designs for it and would love to uh, talk to potential partners about that. Next slide, please. As mentioned, um, because the LED output power goes up uh, year by year, um, we are uh, able to talk to uh, partners about future installations where the reactor uh, output is significantly higher 
In fact, the upper limit uh, of the uh, design of the reactor you see on the right is 750 cubic meters per hour, which would be a single reactor for at least 120,000 people. Um, and that's a very cost efficient uh, application. Next slide, please. So this is an illustration of our smallest scale unit, um, which is the uh, household use or community level uh, uh, device. This is uh, designed for flow rates between two and 10 gallons per minute, which is about eight to 16, uh, uh, eight to 24 liters per minute. The LED lifetime is 20,000 hours, and uh, there are about 8,500 hours in a year. For intermittent use, a device like this would uh, last for more than five years without any uh, uh, LED changeouts or major uh, spare part uh, uh, changeout. Um, a significant benefit for remote rural community, uh, uh, remote island uh, application. It is low energy use. It too could be powered by solar panels. Um, there is unlimited on off capability. Mercury lamps can only be turned on and off a couple times a day. And so a device like that attached to a sink or a community level uh, pump would, uh, would burn out very quickly, whereas our technology does not have such a problem. Um, this reactor is specifically designed to treat uh, adenovirus. It is uh, uh, the world's most protective UV uh, technology, um, quite easily adaptable for use in the COVID-19 applications. Um, and again, can be, can be configured for other uh, applications uh, that, 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 that we have there uh, in the uh, advanced oxidation process using, using chemicals in combination with UV. Next slide, please. And so we are uh, very pleased to be offering our uh, uh, revolutionary UV LED water treatment technology. It is a non-toxic alternative to mercury lamps. It can definitely be used to treat uh, water and wastewater that uh, may be uh, impacted by the COVID-19 virus residual. Um, LED technology is rapidly evolving and uh, we are ever more competitive as the months and years go by. And uh, very much appreciate the opportunity to present here and uh, look forward to the Q&A session and, uh, and the very interesting presentations that have uh, uh, been presented uh, here as well. Thank you very much. I'll turn it back over. I guess it's me, I'm the last presenter. Uh, go ahead, put up the first slide. Uh, and the next one, there you go. Uh, my name is Dr. Joe Newsma, and uh, I am a partner in Twin Oxide North America. Thank you to the presenters. Thank you to the organizers. And I want to let everybody on this webinar know that uh, my PhD is in toxicology and I have over 20 years experience in human exposure to pharmaceuticals, to chemicals and to biologicals. So that's the background that I'm coming to you today as a representative of Twin Oxide. Twin Oxide International is a 20 year old company based in the Netherlands with business globally. They have lots of business in Australia, Africa, India, Europe, uh, Central, Central America, South America, and the Caribbean, including uh, Puerto Rico, uh, Aruba, uh, St. Martin. So Twin Oxide North America is five years old, is based in North Palm Beach, Florida, and we have uh, business in the United States and Canada. Next slide. Next slide, please. So I'll get right to it. Twin oxide is 99.9% .9 pure chlorine dioxide. It's a very broad spectrum antimicrobial. It is an oxidizing agent. So it works across pH from four to 11. So there's no pH limitations with this. And there is absolutely zero resistance in any microbe built in the last 20 years. No microbial resistance to twin oxide. It is an oxidizer and that's why there's no microbial resistance. There's no building of uh, disinfection byproducts because as chlorine dioxide, you can't get free chlorine in this or from this chemical. Without the free chlorine present in your water treatment or wastewater treatment, you don't have the chlorine to combine with organics which result in the disinfection byproducts. Your trihalomethanes and your haloacetic acids, when you use twin oxide, 
exclusively go to zero. So we remove carcinogens from the drinking water. And we also get other things like iron and manganese and other such things, but uh, we get all of your bacteria and all of your viruses. So um, we're also less corrosive than chlorine without adding to the taste and odor of water. Next slide, please. So twin oxide is actually revolutionary in the fact that it's a two powder product. And uh, this is just one of the packaging sizes, if you can see my picture. Um, it's a two powder product. Powder A is sodium chloride, powder B is sodium bisulfate, and it comes in a variety of packaging. It comes in ready to make uh, pill boxes, which are populated with the six pack of pills like this. A lot of different technology uh, for package sizing, for scalability. And it's a very effective potent biocide, and it's a lot more effective than chlorine without the dangerous side effects of the, uh, of the disinfection byproducts. And we're fully in compliance with the EU legislative community. Um, we are EPA certified in the United States, uh, National Sanitation Foundation. We're reliable and we're safe and it's actually very simple to use and apply. So next slide. How does it work? Well, what you do is you fill up a, uh, your, your mixed vessel vessel with a known volume of water based on your kit size from you know, one liter of concentrate up to a thousand liters of concentrate or your larger projects. Our largest project is in Burundi, Africa. It's over 60 million gallons of drinking water a day and they do all of their disinfection solely with twin oxide. So very scalable product, very useful for all continents on the, you know, uh, uh, in the world. So you fill up water, you mix in A, you mix in B, you allow reaction time of three hours, and then you have a 0.3% uh, solution, which is ready for application into your water source, whether that is drinking water or wastewater. Next, uh, next slide, please. So uh, twin oxide is very advantageous in the fact that you get effective and full elimination of all known uh, microorganisms, you know, you, your, your Giardia, your Legionella viruses, including coronavirus. We kill three different types of coronavirus. Uh, we have tests ongoing right now to be approved for the EPA's end list in the United States. We expect those results in the next two weeks. Um, we do have a study out of the German EPA that does show that we kill a virus exactly like COVID-19. So I am absolutely 100% confident in saying that twin oxide will eradicate COVID-19. In addition to other viruses, hepatitis and uh, all of your age viruses, uh, we get them all. I can provide a long kill list if people are interested in that. We get protozoa we get yeast, we get fungi, algae, all of it. It's, uh, it's extremely more effective than chlorine. It's long lasting. You get residual disinfection power in your water systems. Uh, we will eliminate biofilm. Chlorine dioxide is one of the only agents that is uh, known to eliminate biofilm. So you take out where all of your pathogenic bacteria live after treatment at the plant and before distribution to your uh, homes in your water distribution systems. So cleaning out biofilm is always a good idea. Uh, next slide, please. Environmental and health advantages of twin oxide. Obviously, the most important one is no disinfection byproducts. You get less sewage load of uh, your trihalomethanes and those other uh, halogenic combinations. It's very easy and safe to operate. Um, you don't have to have specialized personnel in your water treatment plant. Uh, there is some training and twin oxide provides hands-on setup and training for all institutions that are using using our product. There's no adverse taste or odor effects in the disinfected water. As a matter of fact, every water operating system who have instituted twin oxide 
in the state of Florida has won water of the year in the rural water competitions. So that's actually pretty special. Uh, in one community that we have very good communications with, uh, we know of absolutely zero confirmed cases of COVID-19 in their community. And is that uh, directly related to running twin oxide in their water system? Well, we can't actually say that, but uh, at twin oxide, we'd like to say we have something to do with it. Um, certainly by uh, using twin oxide, we can decrease the amount of chlorine. And uh, by doing that, we contribute to better environmental and general welfare of the consumers. Um, the disinfection with twin oxide is safe. It's effective, it's green, and it's consistent. So please, next slide. The economic advantages, they're listed here. You can read them as well as I can, but uh, there's less chemistry involved to achieve an optimized disinfection result. And uh, twin oxide is not corrosive, so you have less system maintenance than if you're using chlorine. Um, there's no investment for generators or reactors. It's all in the powders, so it is a uh, uh, safe, consistent batch process. There's no construction modifications. There's no use or need for fireproof facilities or separate facilities or specialist staff. So that it's very plug and play regardless of where you are in the world. Um, there's also indirect cost savings as long as operational costs. All of these are looked at uh, on an individual basis for case by case. There's the powders have a five year shelf life. So there's never any supply issues as long as there's planning in the process. Um, there's very little changes usually needed to the plant and uh, the health of the community can never be measured in dollars and cents. Uh, next slide, please. As far as approvals and endorsements, we have approvals and endorsements globally from Germany to European Union to United Arab Emirates to Russia to Oman to Australia, uh, Egypt and Africa and Mexico and the United States. Next slide, please. When you're talking about uh, chlor um, twin oxide, Basically, what you need to know is twin oxide is stabilized chlorine dioxide, and it is going to be the next best water disinfection thing for the world because it's a green chemical and it doesn't destroy the environment by trying to provide clean water. Uh, it's highly pure. It's uh, twin oxide is, is stabilized to stay in the water. Very effective against all known organisms, bacteria, viruses, um, yeast, algae. It's the best available technology for biofilm eradication and Legionella control. Um, it's uh, easy to transport, stock, safe to use. It's very simple to dose and play and plug. It's not corrosive. It meets the world's quality standards and uh, it's endorsed by many governments worldwide. And really, next slide, please. The best way to, uh, to sum it up, it's two simple powders. It's mixed in normal water and it gives you pure chlorine dioxide. Every single time it's pure, it's safe, and it's easy. So you can reach me at uh, just Googling Twin Oxide and hitting the contact sheet, but otherwise my email address is uh, drjoenuzma at gmail.com, D-R-J-O-E-N-I-E-U-S-M-A at gmail.com. Thank you for your time. Muchas gracias, Joe, por esta, por esta presentación y a todos los panelistas por uh, excelentes presentaciones. Uh, realmente es fascinante, fascinante saber lo que existe ¿no? en el mercado. Y, y tenemos algunas preguntas. Vamos ahora a empezar la sesión de, de preguntas y respuestas. Eh, tenemos una pregunta a los panelistas en su totalidad, así que cualquiera de ustedes puede realmente responder. ¿Qué pasa si la persona es asintomática con respecto a las tecnologías de detección? Se hizo, se hizo pruebas sobre esto o, o no? Um, no sé quién quiere responder, Alejandro. 
I think that's a question maybe better addressed by Luminotra and the detection kits. Okay. I don't know if Jessica or... So, cualquiera de los panelistas de la, del bloque de detección, si pueden intentar responder a esta pregunta de, de uno de los participantes sobre qué pasa si la persona es asintomática, si puede detectar o no con esa tecnología. So I, I can start by jumping in. So the research has indicated that asymptomatic carriers are still um, shedding the virus through wastewater. Um, so while they're not displaying symptoms, they, the virus is apparent in effluent. So the research is indicating, and we are continuing to do, we're partnered with the University in Canada on this research, but that yes, it would, it would detect the presence of the virus even from someone who's not displaying symptoms like coughing, you know, et cetera. Excelente. Muchas gracias, Jessica. Eh, no sé si, si alguno de los otros panelistas de ese mismo bloque quiere responder. O pasamos a la siguiente. Pasamos a la siguiente, entonces. Eh, me imagino que la, la pregunta de, de muchos de los participantes uh, es, es sobre el costo, ¿no? ¿Qué tanto le costaría a una, a una empresa en la región latinoamericana o el Caribe implementar una de esas tecnologías? Eh, ¿Cuánto costaría comprarla, pero también mantenerla? Y, y una pregunta que yo tengo es ¿cuál sería el plazo de implantación? También uh, se mencionó el hecho de que hay, uh, en algunos casos hay costos operativos que van decreciendo, eh, pero sería útil tener una idea de rango, por lo menos de esos costos operativos. Y, y, y bueno, lo, lo dejo ahí por el momento, porque hay más preguntas. No sé quién quiere responder sobre esto. Uh, yo podría hacer un, una observación. El estudio como tal no entró en el detalle del costo de la tecnología al ser implementada. Eso, obvio, depende de, de la situación y del, de la localización del, del proyecto. Now, habiendo dicho eso, no sé si algunas de las cuatro tecnologías que presentaron tengan alguna referencia en cuanto a costos basado en, en experiencias que ellos tengan en otras instalaciones, digamos, bajo similares uh, circunstancias. Uh, claro, hay que tener en cuenta que estas son únicamente cuatro tecnologías de las muchas que se evaluaron en el proyecto, no son las únicas. Perfecto, muchas gracias Alejandro. Eh, también relacionado un poco a esto, habría para la con respecto a la implantación de esas tecnologías, ¿eso requeriría eh, capacitar a personal nuevo o personal existente de la empresa? Y si fuera el caso, ¿a cuántas personas debería, se debería capacitar? No sé si alguien más puede, puede responder, que sea Dave, Jared o... Peter, Joe, I'm happy to uh, answer. I'll, okay. I can answer both of them. Um, uh, with twin oxide, the uh, installation maintenance and uh, running cost is uh, based on a case by case uh, analysis. And uh, our timeline to implementation is also based on the basically the the three pillars of project management of any project uh, the the three are you, you get good you get fast and you get cheap and unfortunately with project management you only get to pick two so you have to prioritize what the the, th the best thing is do you need it fast then it's going to be good and it might not be so cheap but if you need it good and uh, you know you get to pick two 
I mean, it's, it's basically that's the, the crux of project management. Uh, Twin Oxide is ready to mobilize, and we have a team that can work with on-site personnel, um, the engineering firm of your choice, and uh, we can help with the implementation of equipment. Our system is very simple, and um, as far as maintaining after it's implemented, then that's, it's obviously budgeting. Uh, to create good, pure, clean water. There's a budget associated with it. Uh, as far as costs going down over time, that is absolutely what we've seen in every other installation. Um, consumption of our product is based on the quality of your starting water and uh, it, the cleaning out of biofilm in your distribution system is always an initial uh, consumption of the product but as the system is cleaned out, we have seen upwards of 50% less product use after probably a year, um, maybe a little bit shorter, maybe a little bit longer based on the individual timelines, but um, it's, uh, it has decreased costs over time. So all costs involved were usually a little bit more expensive than chlorine, but the product is a lot better, carcinogenic free, and uh, your customers are extremely happy with the end result. Thank you, Joe. And um, there was a, uh, había una pregunta sobre la tecnología de, de rayos UV, um, y esa persona quería saber si se podía utilizar en otros ambientes, por ejemplo, para desinfectar áreas de alto tráfico de personas. ¿Podría ser el caso? Yes, uh, so I'll, I'll take that one. Uh, thanks for the, uh, the question. Um, with respect to uh, the reference, my guess is that that is to address a concern that would customarily be called surface disinfection, things like hospitals and so forth. And uh, there are and have been for quite a long time, the cruise industry, for example, has been looking at uh, surface disinfection using UV for quite a long time. It does work. Um, ultraviolet light is very bad for your eyes. Uh, anyone who's been to the beach knows that. Um, UVC is the very high energy wavelengths. Um, so the, the human health and safety concerns for an operator of such a device uh, would, would be significant. In addition, um, the reason why Typhon is primarily focused on enclosed water treatment reactors um, and, 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 you know, a, 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 an internet search could find those folks who are uh, marketing surface disinfection UV systems. Um, we do not uh, uh, participate in that business um, because of the, 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 the danger. And in addition, the, the only surfaces it can be safely used on are metallic and ceramic. Uh, UV, anyone who's uh, had, a, had an old car in a sunny area knows that eventually the sun will bleach things and UVC is much more energetic. So wood, curtains, fabrics, everything is destroyed by UV and uh, surface disinfection applications uh, have to be very carefully uh, considered. Um, I'll leave it at that. Thank you, thank you so much. And uh, estamos uh, casi corto de tiempo, ya se, se acaba la sesión. Muy pronto voy a hacerles una pregunta más. Um, ¿Por cuánto tiempo permanece el dióxido de cloro en el agua? Me gustaría saber si es necesario volverlo a aplicar en la tubería de distribución para que mantenga su eficacia. Uh, the, qu the question answered easily by saying it depends. Chlorine dioxide is a gas and it will come out of the water if it is not enclosed in a closed container. Twin oxide is buffered chlorine dioxide and it has been specifically engineered by uh, German scientists to stay in the water as long as possible. In a clean distribution system, twin oxide has been seen after one dose for 42 days in a water distribution system. Each distribution system is unique. You may have to have some supplemental injection points to control the individual situation. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. Eh, 
Perfecto, eh, estaba en mute, perdón. Eh, muchas gracias. Yo quiero agradecer a todos los participantes y a, en especial a todos los presentadores. Ya se, se está acabando el tiempo. Antes de que, de que salgan del Zoom, por favor, les quisiéramos mandar una pequeña encuesta de satisfacción. Si pueden responder en el chat sería, sería ideal. Y muchas gracias a todos. Esperamos verlos para, para otro, otro seminario y un agradecimiento muy especial uh, del banco a, a los presentadores. Hasta luego. Gracias.